Sometimes I can break through on one pump, but I took like three pumps to get that through. See, exactly, he's like breaking. Mm -hmm. And it goes boom and explodes through the back. Yep. Oh Jesus! <laughs> See, I, my, my my worry is I that I have a problem with that exploding through the deck. I'm not sure they fully understand all the things that could go wrong. Hey guys, Dr. Gary here. I'm here with my good friend and my chiropractor, Dr. Lipnitsky. You might recognize him from one of our previous videos about his procedure. So he actually came up with uh, this idea to do a reaction to this video on first cranial facial release. He thought it'd be interesting for us to talk through it and to do that in front of you guys. There it goes. Oh. Wow, you're really difficult Whew. to get it through. Listen, as a chiropractor for 23 years, I thought I've seen everything, but this seemed to be a little bit off my charts completely. I'll let the viewers know also, like, what, what creates that sound? We sound. have a gas. We have a gas that gets built up between the you know, joint capsule. Okay. It's a negative pressure, just mm -hmm. like you would open the can of Coke. Okay. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> Do it with me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the same way, gas yeah. gets released from the joint. Oh. Cause I, th I think this is just his intro, and then he gets into the yes. elbow. And you see, yeah, you adjust the elbow, you adjust the wrist, you can pretty much adjust. Well, I don't want to comment on this. This is a different video altogether. Oh, right, right, right. What do you think of that? So, so far, everything is in, 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 in order, right? Okay, yeah. So we have <laughs> the classic stuff. Today. Calvin, why do you want to even do this cranial facial release? That's what we're doing today. We're going to do cranial facial release. We'll probably do the Y strap if you need it. Um, what Animal you Cracker. Look, he goes by the name Animal Cracker. I know, I heard he was also <laughs> just the animal. So. Uh, Sometimes I can uh, crack this side, but I cannot crack this side though. All right. So we'll see what happens. Don't crack it right now, but uh -huh. just cover your so, so what do they mean by when, when he can crack the site? I, I don't know. I, I mean, my guess is that he's been watching maybe Doug's other videos and maybe that he endorses cracking your own nose. I don't know. Normally, uh, that's not something that people do. So, okay, this is something I think we need to understand ourselves and, and let the viewers understand. When you increase the pressure inside of a sinus, let's say you do it from inside, right? You when you squeeze your nose and you blow it into it, which we always teach your children: do not, don't, don't blow the nose, both nasals and yeah. nostrils at the same time, right? Only one at a time. There's a reason why we don't want to increase that intracranial pressure, right? Yeah, I mean, there's there's lots of elements here. I mean, one is yeah, not increasing you know the pressure too much. I mean, there's a way to actually blow air into places where it shouldn't be, so you can get air dissecting into the eyes and into the face if you blow out with so much pressure. There have been spontaneous CSF leaks where the, the fluid around the brain actually can leak out just from generating a ton of, um, of, of pressure within the nose. So there's that. So we'll see what happens. Don't crack it right now, but uh -huh. just cover your nose and breathe in and try that. So look straight at the camera, okay? Breathe hard. And that's the right side. Yeah. So now check the other side, squeeze that off and breathe in. And blow it out. One thing that we look at when we're assessing functional breathing problems is like the external nasal valve. And that's really this like ala rim and the ala, and then also the septum is part of that too. But we look at how much collapse there is and the lateral nasal wall is also partly responsible for that. So in this case, I'm not seeing a ton of a lateral collapse for his left side. So mm -hmm. even if he might still not be getting as much air in, you know, a really severe form, this entire area would just kind of collapse in because it's not supported when you breathe in. So I'm not seeing that. But again, there's just so many factors involved with, with nasal breathing. Sometimes it's just the, the, the quality of your internal nasal lining, like the skin of the nose. It's constantly reacting to the environment, allergies, allergens in the environment. And sometimes it can get really swollen. What would you say is easier to breathe? Easy. This side, my okay. right side. On a scale of one to ten, ten means you can breathe amazing. Mm -hmm. Ten. Yep. Ten. I have ten on both. What numbers are you? Ding. Try it. I think my right side is ten, and maybe the the left like seven, eight. Okay, so it's not so bad yeah. today, right? But what do you mean that it feels like it needs to be cracked? What does that mean? 
because sometimes like um when I sleep I had to like you know move to the other side because it's like I cannot breathe for this side like, I don't know how oh to so it, it just his understanding of cracking is very different from uh, he needs to open the the basically the, the passage to he's breathe. just trying to breathe better but right. you know what happens is it's very normal we have something called the nasal cycle and that means that one side is getting swollen wh while the other side is not swollen and they're flip-flopping and it happens every like hour to two hours well, we'll throughout the day that. yeah right. so when you're sleeping well first of all there there could be just a positional element to it but right. it could that, be the that works for you yeah <laughs> but the nasal it. cycle is also you know related to that so some people think that that like is a problem but that's actually a normal physiology mm -hmm. we're doing one treatment today yeah. um so we'll do the best we can in one day, but just know that um, my teacher that taught me how to do this, Dr. Adam Del Torto, said he averaged about six treatments per patient. He had some patients that would do 10, 12, 24 treatments. They loved it so much, especially fighters. He worked with a lot of- um, You have to like pain to, to love this. Getting punched in the face, face trauma, nose trauma. He also worked a lot of long distance runners, like marathon runners or mountain bikers that needed uh, air and they would notice that when their breathing wasn't right, it would drive them crazy. So they might come back for a tune-up every once in a while. Some of the conditions that respond favorably to CFR are breathing problems. Breathing, migraine, sinus, vertigo, Bell's palsy, trigeminal, sleep apnea, snoring, head trauma. I feel like when, once you start getting into emotional disorders and neurological disorders that I mean, it gets so vague, I don't even know. Well, but even migraines, I mean, we all know that the tension headaches, there's so many different types of headaches. I'm actually a member of North America's Hypochondriac Headache Association, and we get, there's so much studies done behind the headaches, and yes, about 80% of them considered to be cervicogenic, meaning something along the neck causing the headaches. Mm -hmm. Usually, it's a soft tissue that causes a headache, whether it's a spasm around the occipital area or it's a fascia problem that wraps around the head and creates mm -hmm. overall tension. There's a lot of different issues. Muscles can refer, you know, myotomes can refer to the head. There's tons of different issues. And, and of course, there's a lot of different treatments. I never seen this to be one of them yeah. because I cannot understand how this would actually unlock most of those soft tissue problems or neck problems, right? On that note, in the ENT literature, 95% of headaches don't come from the nose. Tinnitus, which is ringing in the ears. He doesn't even have that on this list. Bell's palsy. And one of the things that the balloon does is it mobilizes the cranial bones. It releases direct pressure. This is a perfect, perfect picture because that's what we started the discussion right. on. Because my main question to, to Gary was, as I learned it mm -hmm. in my years of, of studying, not only chiropractic, but also I'm diplomated in rehabilitation. So I studied rehabilitation for many years and sport medicine. You know, we deal with a lot of athletes. Of course, there's a lot of head trauma. I deal with uh, NFL players and NHL players and, and uh, professional boxers. As a matter of fact, our mutual patient is fighting in Las Vegas, oh, uh, I believe, next week week so you should expect him back i'm uh, sure he'll be back because i just treat him. i usually treat him before the fight and gary sees him after That's the right. fight but the point is that i never learned that the cranial bones are mobile after the uh, age of 18 19 because mm -hmm. that's when the growth stops mm -hmm. and there's no more growth plates that continue growing right even though we see the this perfect picture of uh uh, you know, dissected kind of like right. a spread apart cranial bones but I never knew the cranial bones to be movable right there's a lot of fascia moving and muscles are moving there's a lot of moving parts but not actual bony structure correct now yes we do change the the craniums do change with aging right yes. and you can explain why it, it happens because that's what affects your job Right? Because Bo bone, yeah, bone, bone resorption. You know, people think like that's only the soft tissue that's changing as we age, like the fat, you know, going down, the quality of the skin getting worse. But really, it's it's the entire bony structure. You're losing bone. You're losing bone density after the age of 25, and that's going to change our facial appearance as well. So that element's changing. But I agree. I don't think the bones are moving. Uh, at, you know, at a later age. On the brain, by having your bones squeezed so tight in your face. It relieves the dural meningeal tension, and the dura is like the sac or sheath on top of our brain and spinal cord. So it releases some of the pressure around that being too tight. And we sometimes feel that way where, you know, like our brain and our skull is just too tight. 
And so now we're going to get started. I'm going to have you start lying on your back first. And um, here, lie face up. And I'm actually going to put this little... So which, you said your left is not as good, correct? My right is the good one. Your right is a good one. Yeah. And your left is a little problem, right? Yeah. Let's look at this thing. So, so this, this is a balloon, right? With some yeah, sort of it's an uh, expandable balloon. Like now, a, and there's some sort of probe that he's holding I, in the I other hand. I think it's just right? like a Q-tip or something like okay. that that he's using to guide. He'll guide this thing through, and then there's an insufflator on the end of the balloon. Right. So we're going to start by putting this in, like a little wooden sure. guide. Yeah, but. Which in and of itself can potentially I just wanted to say splinter and right. break. Like what he should be using is like some sort of more metallic type of uh, stainless steel instrument, something that won't splinter and crack and and be left Hopefully in the nose. Hopefully, not too sharp at the, at the tip. Yeah, right, right. And even with the insertion, you could potentially um, irritate something, and cause bleeding. But yeah, and uh, okay, so let's keep. Well, going. let's hope you did it many times before. So. Well, yeah, but still. So, and maybe maybe he's he's going for the right trajectory, but when I look at this shot at 448, my concern is this reminds me of how people are doing the, the COVID swabs. Uh, <laughs> the, the tendency is to go up towards the brain. Right. You know, they're going up towards the brain. We all had it, so we know how it feels. Towards, towards the eyeball, right? Like, they're wiggling your eyeball and your brain. Um, instead That's exactly of, how it feels. Right. And instead of going straight back. So it, it's counterintuitive because the tendency when you go into the nose with anything is to want to follow the way that the nose looks like it's shaped, which is like this, right? right? But if you go up in there, that, then you create problems because that not, that's not where the back of the nose is. The back of the nose is straight back. Instead of this, it should be straight back. And so when he's laying flat like that, instead of going on this trajectory, right, so that yeah, the, the, the efforts should be you know, directed in, in this direction. So kind of almost But the argument can be all the balloon finds its place somewhere. The balloon looks pretty big. Yeah, it, it could be that argument, but it just seems to me like the way that he's pushing things, it's um, not in the direction of the nasopharynx, uh, not in the ideal direction. But yeah, with the swab too, it kind of finds its place, but you know, it's better when you start with the right trajectory. And it looks super uncomfortable. I mean, look at the guy's face. It's like... Well, we all have something in certain internal so this we looks, know that this can be very really uncomfortable. Really. But right now, which is... So when you're ready, I'm going to um, first fill this up just a little bit. Do you feel it fill? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I wonder what the expanded balloon looks like. It'd be nice to see that. Seal your mouth off whenever you're ready, okay? Like how much does it expand? Big breath in. Does he have different sizes depending on the, the size of the, of the person? I don't know. Or if it's just a one size fits all balloon. Open your mouth all the way and then close it. Oh, geez. There it goes. Oh, God. I don't know what he felt. I didn't hear anything, but maybe he heard something. But is he waiting for a crack? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the question becomes, well, what what's cracking, right? So, um, we'll, we'll, uh, it we'll get... It's very uncomfortable to me, just to watch it. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the fact that you actually close your mouth and you're already creating the blockage of air leaving the, the, yeah. the, the sinuses, right? Now, that expands also from inside. So, basically, create pressure outside, pressure inside. You can probably do a really lot of damage to that cartilage itself. Oh, yeah. Whew. Seems like he's just relieved that it's out of his nose. <laughs> it's just like... That's how I just felt. Yeah. <laughs> and you put this thing in, you expand it, you can cause some internal eye damage too. My nose is expand more. It's what? It's gonna expand like... It expands? Yeah. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense. It's a balloon, yeah. It's a so yours is really hard to get through. Here, yeah. look up at me. He was really blocked off. First of all, I had a tough time placing the balloon because it was just sealed off. So I had to change directions and go around and come back in again. So there was like a wall in the, not a wall, but I had to go around a corner to get so in. That, that's a good point uh, to, to what you were saying before. If you cannot get straight through, 
That means that either you're going around the deviated septum, or you might be going around the cyst, or polyp, or something else. Something else, yeah. And, and at some point, it, may, it might be worth just stopping and saying, you know, this isn't the right patient for this manipulation. You know, I guess you got to create the YouTube video. So yeah, the, <laughs> the um, show must go on. Typically, I would do the other side first, but now we're going to do the other side next. You want to go for it, or you want to yeah. leave that for another day? Uh, we we'll should do both. Oh, okay. he wants more. Okay. Yeah. It. it felt so good the first time. You know, in, in, in a chiropractic, there's a term, crack addict. Oh, there's certain yeah, yeah. people that are absolutely addicted to cracking. That's actually the same people that are walking around cracking their own necks, their own backs. Yeah. It comes from the point that during the manipulation, during that crack, uh -huh, uh -huh. we have some endorphins that are being released. So it actually makes it feel good, even if it's a wrong area to crack. So it's uh -huh. like, I'm really against self-manipulation for many reasons, but primarily because you're creating instability inside the spine. Mm -hmm. So those of you who keep on cracking your necks, you should know that you do not manipulate the areas that are not moving. You do not manipulate a problematic area. Okay, so now we're on the right side. There we go, let's see. Ooh. I know, I feel for him as well. I know. Okay. So, big breath in, and blow it out, and then seal your mouth. Oh, geez, I think I heard something there. There it goes. It looks like he's having a seizure. Wow, you're really difficult oh, to get it through. Oh, wow. So I don't know. <laughs> to your point about a seizure, I don't know about a seizure, but a stroke, it's easy. I think it's the, the right easiest thing to cause is a stroke right now. <laughs> Increasing the intracranial pressure that much. Yeah. yeah. Especially if you guys have any hypertensive crack, problems, yeah. if you have diabetes, it weakens the blood vessels. It's not the best idea. Oh my god! When you watch it on video on YouTube, um, I can hear it because I'm right in there. <laughs> yeah, it's like the focus is all about like hearing the crack. On the inside, I think the the endorphins you talked about are interesting, but I think there's some sort of um, satisfaction people get from from watching or hearing the sound, you know, being done to someone else. And, that, <laughs> I and that's, not. no, I don't know, there, there's something to it. It's intense though, right? Yeah. Like, sometimes I can break through on one pump, but I took like three pumps to get that through. See, and exactly. then do you He's feel it was like breaking. stop, mm -hmm. and then it goes boom, and explodes through the back. Yep. How do you oh Jesus! <laughs> See, my, my my worry. Is I don't have a problem with that exploding to the deck. <laughs> my my worry with with this and with Dr. Doug or other providers who offer the services, I'm not sure they fully understand all the things that could go wrong. You know, you're not supposed to move something that's not meant to move. Yeah, there's a lot of damage I think that's occurring here, um, and so I found this case report from 2003 and we'll put this in the description and also flash um, the cover here for you. There's limited literature on neurocranial repositioning or restructuring, but this um, case report basically highlights these nasal fractures that can occur from this type of manipulation. So this was a patient who ended up with anterior and posterior nasal septal fractures, and you can see them with the arrows. You can see there's uh, an anterior fracture. Basically, the cartilage looks like it's come off the nasal spine of the nose. Mm -hmm. You can see this more posterior-based fracture of the uh, what looks to me like the septal, uh, looks like it's actually bony. So the, sep the posterior, the ethmoid bone um, of the septum looks like it cracked here. So I think the sound that you're hearing is either the, the septal cartilage or bone fracturing um, or, or some other bony elements of the septum or the turbinates that are being uh, outfractured, as I previously mentioned. So there are lots of claims for all types of ailments, medical and physical, that are supposedly help with this. And Dr. Doug brought them, some of them up. We'll flash some more on the screen from, from Dr. Dean Howell's website. And on the website, it says, NCR, which is neurocranial restructuring, works by moving the sphenoid bone, the foundation of all the other bones in the head. When the sphenoid is off, so is everything else. When the sphenoid is properly balanced, everything else can be optimized too. So I wanted to just kind to flash this for you guys, the sphenoid bone, where it's located, just so you can see. It's a very rigid structure and it's very, very well fused with the bones that surround it. And the only time 
that in clinical medicine we talk about movement of the sphenoid bone is when you get something like a Lefort fracture. Lefort fractures are some of the worst um, fractures that can occur from car accidents and bad, really bad falls or injuries and it involves destabilization of the mid face from the um, skull base. That is occurring and all the Ford fractures by definition cut through what's called the pterygoid plates, mm -hmm. which are you know these plates down here, the bottom part of what you're seeing in green and, and we'll, we'll put a, an arrow to it. And these are very, very serious injuries, right? So when there's all this talk in NCR about moving the sphenoid bone, I mean, no, you don't want to move the sphenoid bone. If it's, if it's disrupted, it can cause a destabilization of the entire mid phase from, from the cranium. And so make sure, if you guys are enjoying this content and all the other stuff we put out, like the video, comment below, let us know what you think if you want to see more collaborations. Or if you had it before, actually. Or, or it yeah, if you, if you ever had the manipulation, because I, I went on Dr. Doug's videos and he has a lot of uh, great supporters and people saying like, oh, I want that, I need that, I've had good success. So yeah, I'm happy to hear you know that perspective as well, as long as people are understanding the, the more kind of medical sort of danger side of it as, um, as well. And subscribe to the channel Channel if you haven't already. So let's just kind of go over some of these risks of the NCR. Bleeding, right? Uh, you're putting a balloon in, you're expanding, you don't know what you're expanding into. You could get bleeding, uh, disruption of vessels. You could already have a raw area that opens up. You could have an actual mass in the nose that you're now pushing on and, and causing it to open up and bleed. Infections are possible. I mean, you saw that little wooden stick that's going in there. Balloons, you know, you, you can create little micro tears inside or more than micro tears and in infection can potentially fester in there. You can get destabilization of the septum, the turbinates as we talked about, potential for a CSF leak, which we mentioned earlier, orbital injury, which means hurting the eye from the inside of the nose. And then one of my biggest concerns is like the, a misdiagnosis of something more serious that's happening inside. And instead of going to a professional who can look inside and, and try to figure out what might be happening, especially if there's like a complete blockage on one side, say from like a cancer, if you continue to go through these manipulations, and like he meant, like Dr. Doug said, like some people go for 25 of these, you could be delaying a, a cancer diagnosis potentially for, for months to years. And then um, as, as we know, in the field, nasal cancers are very, very difficult to treat. And your best chance, honestly, with any cancer is just to catch it really early when it's small. I'll leave you guys with this. I found this really interesting. At first I was like, well, does this tie into like plastic surgery at all? Because this is a little bit more like functional nose stuff. But then I found this paragraph on the NCR website and I'm like, I have to, I have to share this with everyone. So it goes, unlike plastic surgery, NCR treatments gradually and subtly accumulate without cuts, bandages, or bruising. If you wanted more symmetrical eyes, for example, you would get a four day NCR treatment series every four to six weeks. In six to eight months, a cost of six to $10,000, your face will be much improved because your cheekbones, nasal bones, and forehead will have been moved into superior alignments, creating improved facial symmetry and reducing wrinkles and creases. You guys don't need me anymore. You will stand with improved posture. Incredibly, you will not only look better, but you will feel better too. And even better is that nobody needs to know, unless you're doing this on YouTube. It can be your secret method to become better looking, stand better, move more swiftly, and to be smarter too. So it seems like a no-brainer, right? Any last uh, comments? Uh, listen, like with everything else, please be smart. Pick your doctors, you know, the way you pick everything else, doing some background check and analysis, doing some homework. I am all for treating the function versus the symptom. In this particular case, to me, it seems like, again, we just, it's a, temporary relief of a basic symptom of poor breathing ability. Dr. Lipnitsky has a new channel on YouTube. Make sure to check that out. He's going to be posting a lot more stuff. We'll discuss a lot of interesting functional versus physical problems and uh, I'll give a uh, piece of my mind of the 23 years I'm studying all over the, the world, uh, treating probably some of the most uh, well-known athletes and dancers and uh, singers and then just regular folks, 35,000 patients down the line. I think there's a lot of things to talk about. Uh. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this video uh, and our take and perspective on this type of manipulation of the face. If you did, make sure to check out our reaction, my reaction on DIY filler. And uh, yeah, let us know what you guys think. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you.